And so I look back and you think, well, he's ordered everything perfectly. Not going to argue now if I have a cross in my life because you don't know what God is working with it, but he's, he's doing it for the greater good. It's like um, what I've been trying to show people is that like, because a lot of people feel hopeless right now. And I'm like, you guys don't realize we're caught up in the midst of the story still. Like this is a, this yeah. is a story, a universal story, and we are in it. And God shows us to be alive during this time don't think he doesn't know what's going on. Like, I know you think the church is a mess and everything's going to fall apart. It's like, God knows exactly what's happening. He had this all planned out just like he had the crucifixion and all these things that you're talking about planned from all eternity. What we're going through right now was also planned from all eternity. Yeah. So Noah, for example, if um, like the book we've been talking about, if I can just plug them, is uh, Crucifixion to Creation. Um, but an earlier one, Adam's deep sleep tells us that when Noah fell into his drunken sleep, remember his son saw him there naked. Um, that's a prefiguration of the crucifixion. It's from the, the fruit of the vine, the work of Noah's hands, that he ended up getting drunk, which is a sign of Jesus' suffering and lying there naked. Um, and upon it hung the judgment of his sons, depending how they reacted. If they laughed, they're cursed. If they reverently walked backwards to cover him up, they were blessed. But I think that Noah, he had no idea that his drunken stupor was prefiguring the crucifixion. Yeah, of course. So people get in a mess now in their life and don't realize it's all part of the same pattern, the universal story. Was well, Samson, when he had his eyes gorged out and was tortured and mocked and abused and then in the enemy temple with his arms stretched out and brought it down, it was such a miserable end for him. He was betrayed by one that he loved in the way Jesus was betrayed by Judas, you know, and w with a kiss, as it were. And, and Samson knew that Delilah was going to betray him. He knew it, and yet he still told her his secret because he was so worn out, I think, with this, not just her nagging, but the, the misery of thinking the one that I love is going to betray me. And he didn't, after that, he didn't want to live. And he thought, what the heck, I'll just fall into their hands. Now, in all that, he didn't realize he is portraying elements of the crucifixion. But he, he held the faith as in he destroyed evil of his day, bringing down the temple and killing more of his enemies in his last day than he did in his whole life. So we in our suffering should be sure that God is working through us the cross and that we need to not lose hope. But how will we bear the pain? How can we tolerate the suffering? is to think of the suffering of Jesus and Mary, which is infinitely more than our own, and they didn't deserve it. We generally deserve a lot of it. <clears throat> we have to grow up and stop saying, oh, I don't deserve my suffering. Well, if, if you don't, if there are people who suffer more than they deserve, which is true, your suffering is for the redemption of others. Why would you begrudge that? Because we've only got one shot at life now. And the measuring of suffering that God allows you to go through is actually a gift. He's letting you hang on the cross. Yeah. And there's nothing yeah. more fruitful for, for yeah. other people as well as yourself. You mentioned throughout, throughout the even the short selection of the book that you, you provided to us. Um, over and over you talked how, how self-sacrificial love is divine love and how that's, that's how we yeah. become like God is, is self-sacrifice. I think that's the pattern of reality, which again is why it's so important that the Trinity, we see it in the Old Testament and in the Mass, that the traditional Mass has at least 40 references to the Trinity. And you wonder why does it keep saying uh, to the Father, through the Son, with the Holy Spirit, who lives and reigns forever and ever, amen. We have to keep saying it to realize that this underpins everything. The Father pours himself out so that the Son, he communicates the divine nature to the Son. The Father holds nothing back. If the father held something back, then the son wouldn't be his equal and he wouldn't be God, which is Arianism. It's a collapse of the Trinity in reality. So the father is self-sacrificial. The son doesn't determine himself, but receives everything from the father, asks nothing more and rejects nothing of it. So he's self-sacrificial in that he's not self-willed, but he mm. um, shares the will with the father. And then the spirit is similarly not self-determining but takes everything from father and son um so this spirit of self-sacrifice is how anything comes to be or is i mean not i'm not saying god came to be but that's the 
the pattern, the stable pattern. If you try to grasp, sorry, go on. No, 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 go ahead. I'm sorry. I thought you had finished your thought. If we grasp things, well, it's no longer grace, right? So it won't work. It won't save. It won't last for eternity. Eternity is this interest in the other. You um, behold the other person and you love them. Eternity is not self-regarding. God is not self-regarding. So when we try on earth to be self-regarding, selfish, turned in on ourselves, even as a church as well, not just as individuals or a family, it's over. You need to be outward looking as well. It's like <clears throat> when Jesus says he who has seen me has seen the father. Um, even when Jesus is silent before the Sanhedrin, like that is God speaking. Like like his silence is, is, is God speaking. It's showing like there are times where you just have to lay down your life and allow yourself to be brutally, you know, yeah just treated mistreated which is why the traditional mass is so full of silence because it is the universal word every other word you could possibly speak has a form it's meaning it's determined it means this and not that so you're saying a particular thing the only way you can say everything is in silence so that whoever's in the church during mass they all have different prayers to offer they're going through different experiences different loved ones that they want to pray for um if you are determining the prayers by having everyone say the same thing out loud or listen to some bidding prayers that someone's just written that morning there's no way that everyone can truly express to god what, what they need to and want to so that's why you need silence to allow that mm -hmm. silence is completely undetermined and in that way it's um like god in being completely open to every reality um we yeah we yeah. need silence yeah it's like when it's it's so strange when you hear people talk about how the the like the new mass is full participation it's like don't <laughs> don't people understand that like my some of my favorite masses are low masses when they're silent and it's and i get to do some real self-reflection and, and look over okay god what reveal my heart to me show me show me where i've fallen short show me. it's like those those moments are where god actually will reveal your own heart and your own sinfulness to you but when there's so much noise going on you never have that time for introspection yeah and if, if i may the um social bay sancta trinitas at the end of the offertory it seems to have like asking four different things and they're, they're all actually the same thing it says first of all we are honoring the remembrance of christ's passion, resurrection, and ascension. Secondly, it's to honor the Blessed Virgin Mary and the saints, including those whose relics are in the altar and all the saints. Thirdly, it's asking for our salvation. And fourthly, it's asking that the saints who we remember and honor will intercede for us. But you realize they're actually all the same pattern built on Christ's passion. So first is the remembrance of his passion, but that is the honor of all the saints because they all live for it. That's how it honors them. They all had that as the highest thing in their life. And that is our salvation to remember and honor the saints because of that. And which is what we do at mass. That's why we're at mass as well to do as they did, which was to honor God for his son's death. And then the last one that they would intercede for us in heaven. What do we think the saints are doing in heaven when we're remembering and honoring them? They love to see us keeping the mass going to the end of time because they all did that. And if we quit it and let drop the ball so that the old mass disappears, all the saints in heaven will be thinking, oh, you idiot generation. You know, <laughs> we kept that going from Adam and Eve through to Christ and from Christ through to the 21st century. And now look at you lot, you've dropped the ball. So we were wrong. The saints, this is impossible. But they were saying we were wrong to put our hope in the passion in the cross because it has been defeated by the enemies of the church that's why i'm totally 100 percent convinced we're not going to drop the ball we can't mm -hmm. any person might decide to stop going or they might think the mass is being so beaten up on the old mass i can't handle it anymore then like you said anthony we're part of we've been born to this time for this reason to uphold the cross when the attacks on it are coming from within in the church from rome yeah it's, 
It's glorious. And we can't lose because the saints can't lose. I think, Jesus where every, I think where everybody is uh, is is so um, baffled right now is that I think everybody had this idea that we we were going to endure persecution, but that we would have uh, you know the Pope would be you know it would be from the outside. I think everybody was like you know the Church is going to stand strong and we would we would endure these attacks from the outside and we might nobody expected the attacks to come from within. But even that is baked into the story. The story the the story of Judas is so central. The betrayal yeah. by the friend, right? And you were even saying even even um, uh, something. Uh, Samson was also betrayed by a friend. You look at Joseph and his brothers betray him. Look, we're going to be... Well, who killed Abel? Okay. His brother, Cain, yeah. right? It's his yeah. own brother who does it. Yeah. And, it's, and Judas is Jesus' brother also. It's like, it, it's there's it's all baked into the story. So I just think that people were thrown for a loop with this whole thing. And I'm starting to see, like, no, we're entering the passion right now and if people really lose focus they're going to miss out on the glorious resurrection yeah so which is why we have the bible telling us what happened from the beginning it's trying to give us this immutable pattern which i write about in the book so that we're not surprised when we find ourselves in that pattern because it is disorientating right and which is why the apostles fled from gethsemane they were completely disoriented, even though Jesus has been telling them again and again and again, the Son of Man is going to be taken and suffer and be mocked and killed. He told them, and they, it's, the Gospels tell us they didn't understand his words until after the resurrection when he explained it to them again, and they're like, aha. So that's a picture of the Old Testament, which nobody understood until the Blessed Virgin Mary and she believed on Calvary. She knew what was going to happen, that her son would be the Lamb of God that was taken and slaughtered and that he would rise from the dead, which is in the throughout the Old Testament as well. She understood that. And then the church has ever since, by following Mary, by, follow, by taking her as her mother, we believe it too. And so we shouldn't be shaken in our life when, okay, we get shaken, but hopefully we're more quick to say okay god i trust you and, and not just i trust you it's like guys look we're in we're in it like this is this is we're in it it's like mm -hmm. it's easy to it's easy to lose focus but that, that's <clears throat> really why i've fallen so in love with typology because it really is like you said how reality unfolds to us you're seeing these patterns over and over throughout the christian story and we're in the midst of a very significant pattern right now and uh, Rob, I wanted to make sure you actually talked about um, the Ad Orientum. Yeah, I was just going to, you a, a minute ago just mentioned uh, being disoriented. And mm -hmm. you you had a, a section in here um, that made that maybe come to realization about that word. You know, you, were, you talk about how um, Ad Orientum worship, you know, facing the East, uh, Orient, um, how the Holy Scripture calls Jesus the Orient. Yeah. So that uh, that when we face away from Jesus uh, in in worship or or at any point in our life, um, in you know versus populum worship or whatever, um, that we're disorientated, like yeah. we're, we're facing away from the Orient. We're literally facing away from Jesus in a sense. Yeah, and we're facing away from the face of God. Which, if you think. Um, when two people love each other, they like they like to look at each other's face, right? They, it gives them pleasure to see the other's face. And the scriptures tell us that when God turns away his face, we disintegrate and die. We need to be, we need God to behold us, to regard us, and we need to behold him. Where do we see the face of God? It's, again, it's in the Holy Eucharist. That is the face of God, but you have to see it with the eyes of faith and not with the eyes of our body where he's giving himself completely for us, dwelling amongst us in the tabernacle, which, of course, was the whole point of what Moses built in the desert with all the people. Hmm. And then the temple is just an upscale tabernacle. So, and that comes through again in the book that the temple of Jerusalem shows us the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, as does Christ incarnate, as does Holy Mass. Because what is the temple? It's the place where God 
encounters man, where he comes to dwell with man, the Shekinah. That's the divinity living there. And Moses would come to the tent of meeting to speak with God. So that's where we go and adore and, and pray and encounter God. Then the body of Christ is shown first, like in the temple, say, you know, the temple was built out of wood, stone and gold. So it's like the wood of the cross, the stone, which is the rock, which is Christ or the altars of the churches and the gold, which is the virtues and glory of him inside his internal virtues. And then the soul is in the life of the temple. What happened in the temple? You had the Levites sing the Psalms all the time. You had the daily sacrifices. You had the Sanhedrin gathered there to make judgments. So in the soul of Jesus, you have this constant praise of God, sacrifice going up, and the judgments of God, the decisions of God, which we see ever since in the, in the church. Um, but it's this place where God meets man. And where, where is that? That is in the incarnation where the divinity and humanity come together for the first time in a fullness in the Virgin Mary, who's the true tabernacle. And loads of this I got from the, the rabbis. You see in Luke, the Shekinah descends over Mary. Yeah. So everything that's happening in the temple and the tabernacle before that is building up to this momentous incarnation. Guys, here's, uh, first off, um, I bought uh, Crucifixion of Creation yesterday at, on the Kindle app. It's seven dollars. Like, it's not like this is some seventy-five dollar book. It, the, the, on the Kindle app, it is seven dollars. If you get if, the paperback, if you have the the Kindle subscription service, it's actually free. Right? Yeah, it's like yeah. I want to get the word out. I'm not trying to make money out of this. I do. I get a bit, so I'm not. I don't need anything. But I, it's such a beautiful book. Like the meditations that I mean, I'm not even. I'm only. I'm only. A, I read the intro. I read the final chapter, and now I'm into the second. Like I read the first and second chapter. It's it's a such an easy read, but there's such deep meditations. And like I was saying, like there's things that I mean, I've read the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament. I never picked up on when Solomon dedicates the temple, 137,000 lambs are slaughtered. Then after the temple comes down and they rebuild it, they have to rededicate it and hundreds of thousands of lambs are, are slaughtered. Then they defile the temple. And it, it, Father Maudsley really does take you through showing how all of these things we're talking about have really been mapped into the design of creation from the beginning of time. When we spoke earlier about the body, blood, soul, and the divinity of Christ being in the tabernacle, temple, in the incarnation and the mass i forgot i think to say the blood of course the precious blood that runs in christ and in the chalice of the mass that's the blood of all these sacrifices yeah and because why bread and wine right why do you have a solid and a liquid and i think it's something to do with the metaphysical division between being and not not being so the bread is like the substance of God that he gives us his life, his being. And the precious blood washes away sin. It takes away not being. Now, when I say it takes away not being, like not being doesn't exist. You think, well, there's nothing to take away. But if you make a logical exclusion of not being and you make a positive affirmation of being, then everything's totally secure forever. And that's what God does with the bread and the wine. He gives us grace with his body. And with his blood, he takes away sin so that everything that is opposed to God, that is not of God, is just completely destroyed and has no standing. Um, and that's why we, it, like God is one and he's simple. But once you have creation, you have a multiplicity. You have God and you have creation. That's two things. And everything in creation has to be multiple. Um, and that's why we need the, the body and the blood to, to give even, what... even the significance of bread right like the in, in the gospel of john um i forgot what chapter it's in but um the, uh, the greeks want to come and see jesus and and archbishop sheen has this amazing uh talk he does about the hour in the gospel of john yeah and it's like when, when this greek person comes over and wants to see jesus philip and andrew bring him over and jesus says oh my hour has come unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies it can it's like the jesus had the mass 
in mind from the moment he starts his, well, really from all eternity, but you see it in no place better than in the Gospel of John, where Jesus keeps talking about the hour. And every time Jesus mentions the hour in the Gospel of John, he's talking about the hour of mass that we are going to spend in worship of him. And a grain of wheat must die before it can be brought back. And it, it's just such an amazing thing how it's all. Well, when God planted the Garden of Eden, there were trees, there were flowers, and there was grass. And they all tell the story of the passion. The tree, because it converts dirt into fruit, which is the passion changing sinners into saints. The flowers, because you have the stem of the flower, which is like the root from Jesse and then Mary, and then the flower is Jesus, the church fathers tell us. This uh, beauty at the end of the stem, because he had no biological children, right? But the flower sends out its scent that you can detect from a long way away, beautiful scent. So Jesus, although he kept him to the end of a biological line, it, it's then spiritualized his presence everywhere. And the grass, because the grass has a seed which has to fall to the ground and die to bring forth more grass, whatever. And so Genesis 1 tells us again and again about these trees bearing seeds after their kind. And it's all talking about Christ who will die to bring forth life after his kind, Christian life in Christian souls. So I, everything about Eden and the, the rivers, the four rivers, is about grace going out to the four corners of the world from the tree of life and um, even do you know the the rabbis say that the holy of holies in solomon's temple destroyed in 70 a.d and the altar of sacrifice which was just outside the temple building where you'd have the holocausts these were the locations of the tree of life and the tree of mm -hmm. knowledge of good and evil hmm. now you can't test that by archaeology it's only it can be a theological investigation but the temple mount has an elevation of about 740 meters Calvary, it, amazingly, on some look on some maps, it's 777 meters high. It's higher, 777, where all the sacraments come from. I think that is the location of the Tree of Life, where the cross stood. And the Holy of Holies of the Temple could easily be where the Tree of the Knowledge of Good and Evil were, both of them in Jerusalem. Um, so Eden was laid out with God's knowledge of what was yet to come in those places. That's a big part of crucifixion and creation, actually, about the place that Abel was killed in the same place that Abraham offered Isaac in the same place that Melchizedek offered bread and wine. Because Melchizedek was the king of Salem, Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. He did it in Jerusalem. Abraham offered Isaac on Mount Moriah, which is where Calvary is. And Abel was killed. Um, it said Cain took him out to the field that this field is equivalent to the outside Jerusalem when Jesus was taken outside. So it's all basically around Jerusalem. And you find Adam was buried there. Adam was created there. The foundation stone that the rabbis talk about is where creation began, which is where the cross stood. Then Isaac met Rebecca there and they went into a tent and started making babies. And that's like <laughs> the beginning of life. In fact, they didn't conceive um, with, I think Esau until some time later. But that's another story. Um, Some of my it, favorite artistry is when you see the crucifix with the skull of Adam underneath it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. This, this is so, and this is where Solomon's temple was built and the Holy of Holies stood, that the Ark of the Covenant came. So there's this place that has been important, a geographical place from the beginning of time to the crucifixion. Then Jesus' blood runs down, touches Adam's skull, redeems him, lifts him from uh, limbo. Mm. Yeah. So what is God trying to tell us with all these events that happen in this place and that scripture records them like Jacob's dream somehow has to be outside Jerusalem because it tells us it's in Bethel, which was formerly called Luz, Light. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of morally the same area of all the places on the face of the earth that Jacob could have had his dream of this ladder reaching to heaven and then he anoints the stone. So he's dreaming of the cross and then he anoints the altar. Which, which is Christ or, or the Mass. It happened in that same environ. So the meaning of all these events, Adam's creation is like the church coming from Jesus' side on the cross. Abel's death being killed by Cain is Jesus being killed by his elder brothers. Um, then Adam's burial is where he comes back to life thanks to the cross. Um, Abraham offering Isaac is the father offering the son 
Yeah. Isaac encountering Rebecca is like Jesus and Mary becoming a father and mother to us all in the spirit. In the tabernacle, by the way, it said in Jacob's mother's tabernacle, he took his mother's tent with him. Not Jacob, sorry, Isaac. Um, because he was sorrowful when Sarah died and he kept her tabernacle. And this is like keeping the Old Testament, the tabernacle. But from it comes the, the new life of the new covenant. Do you, do you have a few minutes to do um, questions from the audience? Because there's people asking questions and I know they'll be so upset with us if we don't. Do you, are you, are you have a time restraint? No, you got well. Go go ahead with the questions, and when I find one I can't answer, I'll say time restraint. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rob, you pull them up. You see who wanted to ask some stuff. 